Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshack. Today we have the beautiful, the lovely Riley Weston, songwriter, playwright, author, so many things. Welcome to the show, love. That was a great introduction. She's one of my favorite. I haven't even got started yet with the introduction. Wait till you. I love it. Well, let me, let me introduce you to folks who don't know you. Uh, Riley Weston uh, started off her career as an actress, had parts on Growing Pains, Who's the Boss, Third Rock from the Sun, Sister Act 2. As a writer, she was hired in, uh, f- to write screenplays for the WB, Felicity, uh, tons and tons of stuff out in LA, uh, was offered a half million dollar screenwriting deal with Disney. She was I? Well, that's what Wikipedia says. So it's I know. Be true. I know they lie. Yeah, because you know it's the truth if it's on the internet. Yeah, but keep going. She continues this to work good. as a, as an actress, a singer, and a voiceover artist. Most recently, she has um, she has written and uh, has they have made three Hallmark movies. One that just aired this week that my wife and I watched, and two Lifetime movies. So. Uh, above and beyond that, she moved to Nashville and has gone headlong into songwriting. Like you would never know that she has all this Los Angeles movie success if you knew her just from Nashville because she's a songwriter. And um, and I really, uh, I met Riley a long time ago and instantly fell in love with her because of her tenacity Aww. and just her personality and have since played the Bluebird a billion times with her in a bunch of venues. And uh, she just has everything that that you can't put into words. She has the the it factor and that's my introduction of riley weston i love that introduction my mother's gonna love it she probably called you and told you to say that with it yeah. <laughs> she did not your mother i don't think your mom has my number you can give it to listen her. you don't ever know uh, we don't want mama to have your number no well you know we met uh you came to my barn to hang out yeah i don't know how we got together but uh tim gaetano one of our favorite mutual oh. friends who passed on a while ago um, who fought Sweet some Tim. hard fights, hard cancer fights, but a good, good man and a great songwriter. And he told me to come see you, I think. No, you told me to come see him. So how did you and I meet? I think I just emailed you. Could be. Maybe. I remember I meeting did. and hanging at the barn. Yeah. And then I introduced you to my wife and my wife stole you. I love like, her. I like got best a friends. crush. Yeah, I do. I love your wife. Well, you know, there was something about you, and I don't know what it is about people, right? It's like I didn't know. I maybe I did know that you had been doing some 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 screenwriting, but um, you know, someone comes to Nashville and so many people meet with you, and there was something about you that was just like, wow, you just have a tenacity. You have like this. You've had success in other things, and then you just sort of put a hundred percent of your eggs in one basket, which is songwriting. And and you've been sort of how long have you been in Nashville doing that? Um, it's gonna be about nine nine years, I think. Maybe oh ten years. Oh my goodness! I know, it's crazy. It was, you know, the move to Nashville was. I'm a big believer in timing, and I'm a Christian. So for me, it's like I feel like God kind of winks in a weird way, um, and just kind of says, "Now do this, now do that." And a lot of people, I think we all have that. Whether it doesn't have to be what you call God, but that little inner knowing. And I think a lot of people are afraid to kind of say that's, you know, a lot of people say, okay, that sounds great, but that's not realistic. I say, that sounds great. It's totally unrealistic. Let's go do it. Let's yeah. just see what happens. And uh, this one kind of was a bigger nudge, but I think it also had a lot to do with, uh, my sister was recently had been diagnosed with breast cancer at that time. And we had lost our grandmother and had some other family members that were um, in remission. And I think something at that timing was like, you have to go do this right now. And I was so unhappy in Los Angeles. I had a a few close friends um, and I obviously was, I had some great success that I was so proud of and excited about, but I also knew I wasn't happy personally. And I think it was just that one little thing that was like, if I don't do this now, I will never do it. And I think because of that, I didn't even think about it. Within three weeks, I had basically had a moving truck, was moving my stuff to Nashville. And I don't think it was until I was like halfway on that three day drive to here that I was like, oh my Jesus, what did I do? What have I done? Like, what have I done? I'm going to a town I've never been to before where I know no one. I've rented a house in the middle of, you know, some Bell Mead I think I had chosen. And only because by the way, the rent was like cheaper than it was in LA and I had three acres. And I was like, oh my God, this is the best town ever. (laughs) But you know, in LA it was like $2,000 a month for a little tiny, you know, three room house. But it, 
I knew I just had to. And now I look back and I'm like, if I didn't do it when I did it, I guarantee you I would have still been in Los Angeles. But I really listened to that little gut that was like, just go, just go. So the real story is like, now that you know what it took to be successful in the movie world, which seems to me like to get a movie made and you've had five of them made, right? Plus other stuff for television, right? Uh, yeah, there was another one for um, that aired on Lifetime that was originally on something else, but that was called another TV movie called Christmas at Water's Edge that I'm actually in. That, um, that, might air that yeah. feels like the equivalent of having a number one song. Like to get a movie yeah. made was probably harder than having a hit, yeah. right? So tell, tell us, you've been in town nine years now and you're still yeah. not like everyone else. Yeah. Tell us what is, how do you correlate it to being successful in the movie world, the difficult level of difficulty, and then trying to be successful in the songwriting world? It, how do you, do you say it's harder in the music, harder in the movie world? Here's the, it's hard for me to judge, but you know what the problem is? I, I, I was an actress before I started writing and still do some of that. So for me, it's, I kind of had, I feel like I had a leg up on movies because of the acting. I knew, I knew enough people where I could say, Hey, I know this is crazy, but I have this idea for a movie or, Hey, I wrote something. Would you read it? Where in Nashville, it's, it's a much, I feel like it's a much harder game. Uh, I think it was easier almost in the first few years that I was here. There were so many more, you know, publishing houses and companies and so many more people that could kind of help. I think now, it, it, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but how I've seen it, like, as you know, we've lost a lot of publishing companies and a lot of the little independent ones are kind of long, long gone. And I think a lot of the times we see a lot of hit songs like top five or three, two, and then number ones, usually it has the artist's name on it, whether they were a huge part of that song or not so much a huge part of that song. But because that person knew the artist or they were friends with the artist or, you know, the same label that they were on that they hooked right. them up with, that it's a little bit easier. And at the same time, I mean, last night at nine o'clock, I was, I was, I had a conference call with an actress who does a lot of hall, Hallmark stuff and she's a fabulous actress and been working a long, long time and I adore her. And she had an idea and came to me and we we're like, okay, well, what can we do with this? And here I thought, well, it's again, if this were ever to go somewhere or any of our other ideas, um, where to go somewhere. I, I, I'm sending her a bunch of ideas today, not just for her, but she wants to produce now, but she's got great connections on an independent film company. So it's like, I feel like I have a little bit easier of a time doing that because I've been doing it longer, but I also feel like it's gotten a lot harder for music where it's almost the opposite in film. It, you, there are so many more independent companies that are actually producing for right. Hallmark in a lifetime. Do you know what I mean? It's I like do. the independent have grown and on the Showtime and HBO on, and every other network. Hulu, Amazon, it's like so Netflix, much content. So much content where we've kind of shrunk it in the music industry. I feel like it's gotten smaller where the movie industry's gotten bigger. All right, here's mean? the here's the, it totally makes sense. Here's the big question. Why do you still do music? I here I can equate this to, again to the film industry. I started writing because I love acting so much and and I'm a pretty good actress. I, but I got sick of being in front of the camera with what was given to me. Now, same thing with writing. I love writing something and getting that idea out, but I love performing it almost more. N that doesn't mean I don't want to write for a guy because I do, but it's like that. I love, I love being on stage. I love being in front of a camera and I love to be able to tell somebody, this is why I wrote this song. This is where it came from. And in the movie side, I can't do that. I mean, as far as like the Hallmark stuff, they're great and they're, but no one usually calls out a, a screenwriter like, Hey, so-and-so wrote this movie unless right. you're in it. Do you know what I mean? And like music, it's like people want to hear the stories about the song that the, the country music, especially country music fans, I think even more than most music fans are so like hungry to hear the stories and they want to hear the background and they want to hear why and how and with who and when and film, they're just like, just get it. Just meet the deadline. Just <laughs> give us the, give us the script. Let's go. And, but, you know what I mean? And then but aren't you, you, are you ever, every time I see you, this is the Riley I get, which is just like a hundred and ten percent, like, you know, supernova. You know, you're always tip top energy. I have yeah. to wonder, is there like every yin and yang? It's like whenever you're at home, is there the other cycle of that where it's like super mega quiet and depressed? Do you ever get overwhelmed um, and depressed about the music business and think, you know, the other side of Riley that I don't get to see? I wouldn't say depressed. I, I jokingly say when I introduce myself to somebody like, you know, what are you like? I said, I am the most extroverted introvert you'll ever meet. 
because when I writing songs, you'll get this usually, unless it's like a, a Debbie Downer song, which I try not to do too many of because they never get cut anyway. But when I'm writing, it will be like, I'll go do something with Joe Bob the dog and do a, a little walk. And then I come home and you might not see me for seven hours and I'll be in my office. Now that that might not mean I'm writing anything. It might just mean I'm in there stressing going, I'm never going to think of any, not even a word like the, it will be hard to write. And, <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? And then it gets going. And once I, I, so it's a really, I don't ever want to say like a depressed thing. Depressed comes for me. It's like when I don't feel like there's hope and I very rarely feel like there's no hope. Huh. Does that, you know what I mean? Like I always find something. And if, if I'm not coming up with an idea or I don't have any movie stuff going on or there's no acting stuff or there's no auditions, then I'm, I'm focusing on music. Right. And I'm like, this song is in my head. Like I know it's got to come out and I know I have to write it. Or I have a show coming up and I got to prepare for that. Like honestly, between us and the world, I haven't picked up my guitar since June. As you know, with COVID, there's not, and there's not any shows. And I was kind of focused on, um, Good Morning Christmas and the rewrites and getting ready for that. So now it's kind of like now that I take a little bit of a break, I have a little bit, you know, some more ITV stuff that I'm pitching, but now I get the guitar back out. I can start practicing again just for me, just to have fun and play and sing for me. So, no, to answer that in a very long, long-winded, curvy road, I very rarely get depressed. That's a... Uh... That's something. I love what I do. That sounds, I just love it. Like I love life so much. I just don't know. Usually when people have that, they have the other side, which is like super depressed. The world is over. And then they come out and they're rocking on the top of the roller coaster, you know, and then they're down back yeah. into the valley. Yeah. I think, I think it's also because I have a lot of different things to kind of balance it. Like, like when something isn't working music wise, then something might be working television wise. Or that's a secret weapon. I mean, tenacity, and you have a ton of it. Like I look at people in my life and I'm like, oh, I wish I was more of that. I wish I had, when I see somebody in a room, I'm like, oh, I, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be more of that because I really admire that. You have got this, I don't know what you call it. Tenacity, spunk, energy. You've got this thing that you feel when you come into the room, the room gets a little bit, a little better. And I don't know oh, what that is that about people. Cry. That's so sweet. Well, it's good That's for songwriters, but you usually is associated with a heavy downside with people yeah. that go into deep depression. You know, yeah. even me, I'm pretty, I think of myself as fairly stable. Yeah. But, you know, I still have that where I'm just like, what is the point? What are we yeah. doing? <laughs> the crippling <laughs> self out. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Where's it's even butter talk knife so I can start cutting myself. It's, it's all, it's almost like the, success that you have in the movie world might be demoralizing to your music yeah. world because it's yeah. like you you're killing it and then it's like oh and you've been doing great it's like you came to town you book rounds at the bluebird and yeah. at the listening room the two top yeah. songwriter joints yeah uh you consistently book rounds at both of those places you opened yeah. up on tour for lee bryce lee bryce yep Montgomery uh, Gentry too, yeah. All my hit songwriter buddies play, yeah. go out and play gigs with you. You get great co-writes. I'm sure you've had a, a bunch of cuts that we, you know, that are, you know, indie artists and maybe Canadian artist stuff. But it's like, you've got to like, at a certain point, you look at somebody and you're like, wow, man, how do they keep it so, just so going all the time? How do they keep the energy up? Because it is a world that kind of slowly beats you down to stop. It is. And, and I, the entertainment industry, and trust me, and I, I, I should, I mean, to be completely frank, it's like, there are, I'm sure days and there have been moments, the moments that I felt like that, like you've described where it's just like, why bother? Why am I trying? Most of those out of my entire lifespan, if I look at it, 99.9% .9 of those days happened in Los Angeles and not to put Los Angeles on the Debbie Downer list. But for me personally, it was not, um, personally and professionally, there, it was so many, it was like that. It was like this every day. And sometimes during the morning, you'd be down and by the afternoon, I'd be up and by night, I'd be down again. And I think it became so much, God, it was just so hard to keep up with that energy. And I, I kind of just did one of those really big self-realizations. You know, I started going back to church when I was in LA. I started singing for them, you know, and, and kind of singing country, which is what, how I, I really felt drawn to and kind of grew up on, as opposed to trying to fit into like that pop LA mold, which I freaking hated. So, um, I mean, I remember at one point somebody had me, you know, going in auditioning and they want literally the, the audition for it was, we want a, 
a cheap man's like Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, y poppy, you know, blonde cutie patootie. And I'm like, oh, I just about threw up in my mouth here and that. Like, you've got to be kidding me. But I went and they're like, we can send rest of you to China and Japan and you're like the next big whatever. And I thought, great. I don't speak either one. I don't don't think I like any of that food. And I don't know what even the food is. And I don't want to be on tour in a place I don't even know how to speak their language or eat their food. First of all, I'm going to starve to death. And second of all, I have to sing crap I hate that I'm not, I'm not passionate about. And I remember when I, I turned it down and I cried for days, my dad's like, look, you made the decision. And that was a smart move. It's been, it's been like so many times that I come up to that place where I'm like, I'm almost there. And I was in LA and it's like, do you, you know, I have a one movie, my passion piece, my Rocky, you know, and I, I have a book based on it. I have a screenplay. I wrote the theme song. I recorded it. Like I've been ice skating for years to prepare for this role. Like, and I don't know that it will ever get made, but I also know when I've come up against numerous times, people saying like, we're going to buy it. Just walk away from it. You can't be in it. And I've like, there were so many times in LA where I would cry endlessly for days. Like, what do I do? I could sell it and just walk away and make money. And, and, and I just always have gone back to both my mom and my dad that have said like, will you forgive yourself at the end of the day? Was this something you're going to be proud of? And I would be like, no, absolutely. I'd rather never have stuff done if it's not done because I wanted it done, you know? And I just feel like life is so, when I moved here, I just made a, a conscious decision to be like, look, you've got a choice to be unhappy or not. Uh -huh. It's that simple. And, and for all we know, you get a one go round. And, and I've wasted so many days being not happy that it's just not worth it. Do you think, you know? that, do you think that the, the nine years that you've been in town, Yeah. do you think you could have withstood nine years of it had you been chasing the working man's Britney Spears model or the selling your life story or your dream story? Do you think you would have been able to sustain nine years of doing that stuff? Or is it because you're focused on some stuff you really believe in and you're staying true to a compass? Yeah, I think that's exactly what I think. I know for sure, especially um, on the music side too, if I had, if I had chosen that route or and done the pop thing, which I desperately hated and still do. Um, but if I, especially if I had sold my script any one of these times for a ridiculous amount of money to walk away, I would be in the place that you described, which is why bother? Right. Because yes, can I write a script that good or better? Probably I could if I were, if I wanted to. I'm sure I could. That's not the point. The point is, I am not a trained actress. I am not a trained writer. I am not a trained singer. I am not a trained songwriter. I mean, I have never had. Tra it's all that gut thing that says, "Go do this." Mm. I've got your back. Whatever you want to call it, I call it God. I've never had that. Like, even when I'm like, oh, Jesus, can I do this? Like, there's been a lot of shows. I'm like, what the hell have I done? What am I doing? And that's every time I play with you, as you know. <laughs> but I love JoJo. Um, but still, like, you know, it's like daunting. I get up there and I'm playing with people. They all have number ones. You, you have three. And, I, and, I, and all these other cuts. And I'm like, yep. One of these things is not like the other. It is me. Let's, we all know this. But I also know I wouldn't be there unless I was supposed to be there. Like there's nothing mm. I'm put in any position that I can't handle. If, if I couldn't handle, I wouldn't be there. Right. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, I'm not prepared for it probably, but I'm there. So I'm going to do the best I can. What is the, what is success for you? Like, what oh, happy. You... So happiness, like... happiness in the big picture, me being happy, but also success to me would be like being in a position where I could take these crazy crazy ideas I get in my head as a songwriter, as a writer, and let me be able to give them out or share them with people as a singer and as an actress and a producer. <laughs> so I can like, I have, I just want to be able to like, I feel like, you know what, and, and it's terrible to read reviews. It's never good. But of course I did after the weekend of, of good, of good morning Christmas airing and, and looking at, I mean, hundreds, hundreds of, and Hallmark's great because they have such an amazing Die hard fan base the hallmarkies man. They are like they will go to bat for anybody on hallmark and any movie for hallmark but to look at them all and see All the different like like hey, this was a little bit different than the other hallmark ones right? This was great and the chemistry was awesome But the writing was this or this and the story was great and a little bit different and I thought like that's the kind of stuff you want to be able to do all the time because Look, especially this year. We've had a crappy ass year Let's just acknowledge that. Like a lot of people have had 
the hardest year of their lives were this year that they've lost people, they've lost jobs, there's no money, they're coming in. We've all have it, had to like redo our lives in a whole another way and not just us, obviously the world. And to be able to take like an hour, I'm gonna start crying, an hour and like 40 minutes of somebody's life and give them like a break from this like crazy COVID year that we've all had where we've all had to like look at life differently and hopefully have a different attitude to be able to like give somebody who's had a really rough year that hour and a half or hour and 40 minutes that, that it aired to go, that was so awesome. And I was taken away into another town that yes, is all fictional, but I could go live in this little town of mistletoe and just mm -hmm. forget about my life for a while. You yeah. know, and whether that's like a movie or a three minute song that you could take somebody on a journey to like that right there, that like, as you could say, it makes me emotionally happy. Like it gets me, that's the kind of, that's the kind of journey I want to give to people. We were talking about this prior to going on air. Um, those towns, like when I was watching the movie, I told Riley, it's like they heat the streets because the heat, the streets are perfect. <laughs> So they look yeah. like they've got heaters in the streets. And yeah. then the snow is like literally perfectly spaced on every branch. And I noticed yeah. like even behind the building that you're shooting in the foreground of, they've got beautiful lighting up into the trees behind yeah. the building. It's like some of the most extraordinary, like every rooftop is perfectly peppered. You want to hear how they do it? How do they, and you tell me they did it in September. So it wasn't real. It was totally not real. And it was supposed to be. Um, so the streets, if you notice, if you watch any TV show or commercial, um, nine times out of 10, the streets are going to be wet. So they'll hose the streets down. So they look, so when the lights hit it, it looks all like glistening. Right. And then they have sheets of, of like, like you buy to like, and I have a huge village in my dining room, like a whole Christmas village. So they get like the sheets of white. And so, and they just lay them over the bushes and lay them on the trees and they kind of poof them up a little bit. So it looks like it's kind of snow that's uneven. But it's like a sheet. And so if they have like a big old, like a hedge like this, the big sheet just kind of like, they just drape it right over. And with all the light, it looks It looks snappy. incredible. At nighttime, that's why you see a lot of the nighttime stuff because it looks, now they also get like what they call fish ice is what I thought. That's, I think that's what they called it. Um, and they had a lot of trouble. Like in the, one of the walking scenes, actually towards the beginning of the movie, you had the, the leads, Alice and um, Allison Sweeney and uh, Mark Lucas were walking down this little sidewalk and people were like kind of taking their picture and there was piles of snow here and there. So they'll have like snow chunks that they just kind of place specifically, you know, and that again, it was all wet in the sidewalk. So it looks like snow's melting and they kind of walk in between these little like snow patches, but they were because of COVID were having trouble getting like real ice even like to like place and real snow, which they usually can get like the fake snow, but not like just a sheet of like white material. Right. But it was it was tough this year. But and again, there's a couple of scenes too, like you saw in the very beginning when they get to the the town of Mistletoe. There was like seven people, like yay, they're here. <laughs> and how it was written was like it's it's packed with people. They have to kind of spread everybody out. But again, because of COVID, there was like you know a couple of people with signs. I'm like, oh god, COVID. You know, because you had to be careful how many people were on set. So. That's that they do a they do a super killer job at it. It looks amazing. Do. do you go on set? So you no. weren't there where the shooting where where was mistletoe at? Was that uh, Vancouver? They shot okay. in a little town in Vancouver, and so a lot of times. And I get I understand the thinking behind it. And this is not just Hallmark; it's a lot of production companies and networks. To have a writer on that's just the writer. If I'm on the set. And, and the actors are like kind of collaborating. And as an actress, I know what happens. You say a different line or something else comes up or you say it differently than it maybe was meant to be said, but that way works too. Um, and as a writer, you could have, a, not me necessarily, but a writer that would say like, ah, that's not how I wrote it. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, then you're like having a discussion on how it should be said. And you're having, you know, a writer that's saying like, that's not how I meant it. And an actress is saying, but that's how it felt. And a director that's like, let's try my way. So it's kind of taking one of the energies out that would want to, you see this a lot in a lot of films, you see like a writer who directs or a director who writes because they have the vision and no one can tell them otherwise. And that's why you see a lot of actors that start producing and that way they can kind of control like what they feel is the best way. So I totally get why I am not. So I've just now, I'm just now intending to be in my movies, even in a smaller role. Keep my and mouth shut. I've done that once. That was fun. Uh, have you always been like, have you ever been mortified? Like that's not the movie I wrote. Oh, absolutely. The very first one for Lifetime. 
um, it's horrific. Uh, there's no way that's really terrible. Um, and Elizabeth Berkley stars in it, and she's a wonderful actress and a, and a super nice chick. Um, but it is, <laughs> it is a horrible, horrible movie. Um, I mean, there, at one point, even at the end, somebody is supposed to die at the end. Not that anybody's going to see it, but, and they shoot the person and they fall into the pool. And I swear to you, like what the next little clip you look over and the person's moving in the pool. I'm like, seriously, the person's supposed to be dead. You couldn't find a take where they're not moving in the pool. Like, come on, come on people. Like, and if I were, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I'm like, that's just cheap. That's just, that's just like not paying attention, but it's, it's really, I remember it was the first movie I had done and I had, we were in the Adirondacks and I had my dad and my stepmom and my mom and we were watching the director's cut and we were like so excited. Like my first movie, this is insane. And we're all around that. <laughs> I shouldn't probably tell you, it's kind of an inappropriate scene, but it's lifetimes. So it was on television or this scene didn't make it. Thank Jesus. And it was like, they had Elizabeth do an inappropriate action that would make it look like she was about to do something very inappropriate on a man's body. Let's just say it like that, okay? And so they, they did this and the camera panned and they showed Elizabeth like kneeling down. I'm not even kidding you. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> and my dad's like, Riley. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't write this, this is not. The, and there were so many lines that I'm like, didn't write that, didn't write that. And you're just like, I mean the whole movie, I was like, oh, Mother of God, please don't let any of this make it to the like. I was, I mean, I sat there. We all sat there like this. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! Well, in like, the this, in the songwriting world, you would have a say over that. You could say like, "Hey, that's exactly." You, know, you have a first use license, which like you it, grant, but they can't change. They couldn't change something significantly past your. <laughs> like, no, and but in movies, it, they can do whatever they want. Yeah. You know, they can do whatever they want, I unless mean, you get to a certain direct. part in your contract where you could say you know, I, you can't do anything different until I say it's okay or until I agree to it, but no, especially you, if you're for a network, once you turn it in, it's all theirs. Right. What were you saying, Mike? I was going to say, have you had any interest in directing to keep more control over it? So funny that you're asking that. So I've always said no, no. And I still, I'm going to say probably not now, but definitely not a no, but probably not. But what I do want to I want to start putting myself in the role, like quirky, fun, smaller roles so I could keep doing what I'm doing, but also get back to acting again, which I miss desperately and producing because producing, you can also kind of say, Hey, that doesn't work. And this is why directing is like a whole nother. I would say, well, I've never had a class in it. I don't know how to do it, but I also didn't know how to do anything else I did. And I just did it. So right. I, I sucked a little bit until it got less sucky. I mean, <laughs> you know, but maybe, maybe someday. It's not a definitive no yet. You don't have to tell us what you make, but if somebody sells a script to a yeah. Lifetime or a Hallmark, is yeah. this like 100 grand, 200 grand, 50 grand? <laughs> so here's, here's it, it depends. On it, uh, it, here's how it works. Um, sometimes you can sell your script outright and it's about a $50,000 thing because it's usually, that's like the Writers Guild minimum. If you just give them a script and they say, we like it, and then you'd go back and you'd develop it or rewrite it, they'd have to pay you for that. How I've done it in the past with um, networks is usually I go and I pitch them an idea just in my head. And then they say, give us a couple pages on it. And I write up two or three pages, all for free. If they decide they wanna put it into development from that point on, they do um, what they call like a step deal. So the first step would be um, you write the treatment. So that's like eight to 15, 20 pages at the very, very most. and they pay you 50% up front, they pay you 50% on the back, and then we wait, and then they read that, and everybody at the network reads it. And if they agree to it and they say, this could be a great movie, then you move on to the next step, which is a script. Um, and they pay you 50% up front, and then the other on that back end. And then you write um, you know, another quick draft just to see once you get all the notes, and then from there you start all the rewrite process. Is there, they have to pay you for a rewrite or they pay you for a polish. If it's like a quick polish that should take you a couple of days to rewrite it, only a few notes, a couple of pages of notes or the big rewrite. And this was, I mean, I did a couple of rewrites on this and I mean, a couple of polishes and a rewrite. So all in all, you could stand to make between like 50 to 75,000 ish for that one script. Um, then when they air it, then you get the residuals. So on a major network, you get paid every single time it airs on uh, cable networks, they have a different deal with the unions and they have like, uh, 
like Hallmark re-airs in Lifetime, they re-air their movies an awful lot, as you've noticed. So they, they have like what they call like the three month cycle, like a 12 week cycle, and they can air it as much as they want in that time. And that's one chunk of money. Now, every time they buy another cycle, it will go less and less. But, you know, you, you obviously want to have them air it as much as possible, even though you're not getting paid for it every single time because you want people to see your work. So, so and, it, and once again, not your money, but what yeah. would that cycle pay somebody for residuals? So it's been a while since I've had a movie like this. So um, I'm going to guesstimate somewhere between like probably 25 and 30,000, okay. I think. I mean, I'll let you know when that changes. We can do an updated little <laughs> interview. No, it should be like, I, I, I really don't know that one. It's like probably between 25 and 30 over the, you know, the, the couple of few months. depending. And now they own that outright. It's not like a songwriter. You would keep your songwriter's portion. They yep. own it in perpetuity. You have no claim. Yep. It's a work for hire. Yep. And that's why when you turn it in and they, and they want to change whatever they want to change, even if I, I can fight for something and say like, this is why this doesn't work. Um, and, and try to, you know, have them. And there's sometimes it works with like, I get it now. I see what you're talking about. Um, and, and sometimes it's just like, nope, we no nope, for whatever reason, like there was a big scene. One of my favorite scenes in the movie is not in the movie, which was this huge toboggan scene. Well, we ended up shooting it in September, not January. So there was no snow. And then I thought of that, there's a, a, I created a thing called the three-legged wreath race where the legs are tied together with garland and there's a big wreath over their bodies and, and that became the new toboggan scene. Right, but right, right. I was going to say that was in there. That was in there. But I, sometimes they can call and say that just doesn't work. We right. don't have the, we can't get that. Or That'd be tough as a songwriter, like to have somebody coming at you yes. and, and saying uh -huh. like, hey, you know, that whole third verse. Yeah, don't work. We're Trash not going to do that. Yeah. That'd and be really what, tough. Like, that's the other side of it. It's like, we don't want to do that third verse, but here's what we want to do instead of that. And it's something from a whole other you know, song. You're right. like, well, that doesn't seem at all like it fits. But right. you make it fit because that's your job. And that's, and that's the, <sighs> that's a tough one. You find a way to like it and make yeah. it work. So in Nashville now, are you interested in, would you, is your goal to get a publishing deal? Is your goal, what um, is your it's a good question. So I think my goal is never supposed to happen. If I had my way, I'd be doing short tours and opening up for great people that I respect and love and writing songs and, you know, doing, you know, the artist songwriter stuff in between other hyphens. <laughs> I mean, I know it can work because I've done it before. It's just, um, I don't know. A publishing deal would be great. I also don't know if I'm ready to give up control over a lot of other songs I've already written. And I know that's part of it is like coming in with a lot of stuff. Part of me says yes. And part of me is like, I'm kind of open at this point to, to whatever happens. And it's been, um, I don't, I mean, I, I meet with people. I haven't this year as much, obviously, but I've had a lot of, um, last year I met with a lot of different publishers and kind of had some discussions and then, you know, COVID hit and everyone kind of kicked back and put on their fat pants. So. Um, I want you to know I'm wearing jeans. Like I have real pants on for y'all, even though you can't see them. And I was kind of worried because I was, oh yeah, you did. I almost, oh, listen, I've got on jeans, jeans. Like, and I was a little afraid putting them on. Like, can they butt in? Are these going to work? I don't know. I might be going back to potato bombs. <laughs> Cause it's been a while, but I was so excited. I'm like, I could, I'm going to put pants on like real pants. <laughs> they might not button, but I'm putting them on, man. <laughs> Sometimes when I put pants on, it feels so foreign. Like it it's feels so like, weird. like I'm wearing a tuxedo. Like, I know. <laughs> I mean, when I get home, it's like, I got to get this off. I have to get it off. I mean, trust me. I'm thinking for the interview number two, which is happening in about an hour after this one, I'm going to go back to the, to my pajama pants because they're very festive. And um, and it is Hallmark base for that one, so I can kind of make it work. <laughs> go to my Christmas pajamas. So, you know, when you say, like, your goal is to be happy, and it seems like you're yeah. happy. Yeah. So what is that? What do you do for a goal? Like what more? What, what's on Work. the radar for you in regards to things to knock down in the music world? In the music world, um, get some songs recorded. Songs that people can hear, songs that I'm proud of. Um, I, I wrote one song this year that I'm, two songs that I'm super proud of. Um, totally, completely different. And um, both of them are going into the studio hopefully sooner than later. And, and hopefully they'll get cut. Um, as an artist, I just want to be up on stage singing again. I want to, you know, to, when you have that taste of like the full band and opening up for a lot of people 
and just seeing that energy. Now, again, I will perform if there's three people. I don't care. And you're going to get the same dang show that you would have gotten if there's 5,000. I don't, that to me doesn't matter how many people, but there's a good, when there's great energy just to be up on stage performing, that's definitely, hopefully we can get back to live shows sooner than later where so I know you there's some been playing out. I haven't. And I, I did once in June at the listening room actually. And, um, we had a blast mostly, but I got to tell you, uh, I was totally freaked out and I'm one of the, I'm, I'm on the airing on the side of, I really don't want to be sick with COVID or spread it. So I have been like ridiculously vigilant about not going out as much as possible. You know, I mean, not going pretty much anywhere and wherever I do go to one place uh, is Walmart to get my food um, because I'm that picky. And also I let myself ice skate once a week and they take my temperature. We have to wear masks. It's, you know, there's, I, I go and there's three people on the ice. So it's when we're completely spread out, but I, I am, I did not feel comfortable playing out, even though the listening room did a great job. We are so far away from everybody, but people want to talk to you afterwards. You know, they want to, again, that interaction with fans that are just so awesome and they're so supportive and they want to, not necessarily hug you, but they want to be close to you and say, Oh my gosh, this is great. What's up next? And they want pictures. Right. And there's that just, it was, I remember just being there and, and it was still like kind of in the, in the middle of it. And of course now we're in a whole nother level of, of crazy with COVID, but as artists, we were like seven feet away from each other. So like looking down at, I remember looking at, you know, Will Nance and Ken Blaze, it was on the other side and we were like, Hey, you know, it was so weird. And we were so far apart from the stage, like towards the end. And as you know, we've played there before where we're like, well, we're not on top of each other for sure, but we're definitely like, we can like. You stare, you're sharing a stool between you yeah. with drinks and capos. It, yes, there was none of that. Um, and it was just a weird vibe. And I just thought, you know, this is one of those things that I just, me personally, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm going to try to do my part and right. stay home and wear a mask whenever I can and not go out as much as possible. So yeah um, i haven't the, played at all yeah i've been asked to play i think maybe it was with you i was booked at the I, it was. yeah that show got canceled in the listening yep. room show i was yeah we were at the, our canceled. april show at the bluebird got canceled and they're still not back they're doing specials well, you, you know can't, at you cannot Lindsay, but, bring the bluebird back oh, i mean you're like sitting on each other's lap literally yeah. literally which but, breaks my know, heart but it, i i have missed it uh it's just I just, uh, people have asked me to play, but I've just been like, yeah. oh, I'm not going out. No, it's just, I feel like we're all just taking, I know it's, like I said, it's safe where those places are. I'm sure they're doing everything and then some to keep everybody safe. Me personally, I just would feel better like staying put in my house. Yeah. I, I know I'm good and I'm not, it's one less person that has to be out doing something. And that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. So but as far as that, you know, hopefully next year we'll get back to it at some point next year. God knows when, maybe in the summer or something. But, you know, I want to I wanna be writing more. And, um, you know, I, the bigger picture is kind of getting to the place where I have movies that, you know, I have a little part here and I have a little bit more of a say where I can say, hey, I've got three songs that are perfect for that. Here's exactly where they should go. <laughs> right. and, and, you know, at some point, like when I pitch it, say, here's a song that you know, kind of the theme song. And when they're reading that, you know, 15 page treatment, have that song in their head that says, Oh, wow, I see it. Like it just gives them a better vibe. So that's which, kind of which by the way is genius. If you're, if you're going to use a tool to get opportunity in Nashville, if you could say, people don't necessarily think this, they'll come from another town and everybody from LA wants to write country where they're in Nashville and everybody from Nashville right. wants to write pop when they're in LA. Oh, right. But the reality is those people, want you in the room because they want to get something from you. Yes. So it's like for you to be able to go in and say, Hey, we're going to write for this. We're going to write this thing for hopefully someone in country to cut, but we're also yeah. going to write it. And I think I can get a place in this movie that I'm doing. That's Absolutely. like an incredible just, opportunity. Yep. That's, and I have a couple ideas um, that are brewing that are music based. Um, and there's one that I had somebody interested in and I said, well, I'm in it and I'm going, I'm going to try to like get a big name female, older female country star. Um, and it's three generations of women in country from the grandmother to the mother to me. Um, and about, you know, a girl who is, is her mom is a huge, huge, huge artist. And, um, she's kind of been in her shadow and, uh, she is a songwriter that 
doesn't sing because her mom's the singer and she's just never wanted to kind of, until she, someone kind of hears her sing and says, that's ridiculous. You should, you're, you're a great singer. Why aren't you singing? Well, because that's what my mom does and that's what she does. And I don't want to be like my mom. Yeah. And so, you know, there's this big rift between the mother and the daughter. And of course it's Christmas time. This is a, this is a new movie. Yeah. No one knows it yet. Yeah. Well, I'm writing it. So <laughs> hopefully, well, but it's, I'm excited. So hopefully, um, I already thank God this doesn't air till 2024. This episode. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's 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 all it's all uh, you know. I have it all registered. But me and Mike. Okay, we're gonna pitch you something. Yeah, go. Mike is the slimy record executive, <laughs> right? He's the guy okay. that's like trying to lead you down the the really bad path, the dark dark path. Yeah. Um, I'm the record producer that sweeps in and tells you to go with your heart and to really follow what you believe. And in the end, we go on to huge success. While Mike, his life spirals down out of control into Skid Row. He goes back to Lifetime. Yeah. He goes back to the Naughty Girl movies. Oh, I don't like this. <laughs> he comes from LA. I it. <laughs> He's got like a really long, like uh, different strokes limo. You know, <laughs> pulls up the the 1988 Lincoln Town Car limo. I want script <laughs> approval. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All I right, just a, totally just an idea. I'm just. Hey, let's just let's just let's just spitball this. You know what I mean? All right, I can work with that. I can you totally better, work with that. Hey, you better believe I'm going to sue you if that shows up in your movie. <laughs> I, you know what? As you should. And by the way, you I don't think it's going to show up, right? If that ever goes anywhere, don't let me write again. I'll lose all. Well, more. before before we let you go, I want to. Okay, let's say. Let's say. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a hypothetical. Okay. I, I'm sensing what it is for you is just to, like for all songwriters, is to be heard, is to be understood, yeah. to tell a story that connects with people that is your story somewhat or your perspective on a story that someone else says, this is my story. Right. And you've written it successfully for them. Let's say you do that and you have a number one song in, in country. What is that? Is that just like the top of the mountain for you? I mean, <clears throat> obviously it would help financially. Obviously it would help kind of being... Um, Rec recognized in Nashville on the executive side and on the business side to be like, okay, that's someone that you have to kind of give some sort of respect to and or just acknowledge. Like, okay, that's someone maybe we'll work with someday. For me personally, though, aside from like the financial aspect and, the, and having like inter opening up some new doors, it's that means that a lot of people are hearing something that I had an idea for, whether it was like on a run with a dog or playing in the snow or decorating for Christmas. It's that same thing, whether it's a three minute story that I can take somebody on or a movie that does really well in ratings, mm -hmm. whoever got to see it or hear it, they got to take a three minute break or an hour and a half break from their life. And they obviously liked it. It was a yeah. good break. If it's a number one song, whoever gets to sing it. On um, not me necessarily, but whoever does, it's like they get to have, and then that person gets to win too. Like yeah. then they get a number one song that they wouldn't have had if they didn't like hear that song and say, yeah, that spoke to me. And I feel like I've got to, you know, I want my fans to hear it too, because it speaks to me. So the process is what you love. It's not necessarily the outcome. No, look, here's the thing. If we all chase the outcome, if that, and I'll say me personally, if I just chase the outcome, then I would be where in Nashville, I would still be like I felt in Los Angeles, which is Debbie Downer, mm -hmm. right? Because the outcome, that's split second. It, like, the, like, it's funny. I had my best friend lives with me now, and my other best friend from Atlanta drove up. She quarantined. She did all the right stuff, and then she came to so she could be with me for the movie night. And the three of us sat our matching pajamas. We watched the Hallmark thing, and my name came on, and we all screamed. And then we watched the movie, and it was over. Yes, they loved it. They went to bed. I stayed up and worked on like tweeting and texting people back and like trying to do the PR stuff, but it was done. The outcome, like it was done. That one moment after people watch it, it's over with. Are they still talking about it? Yes. But it was the journey of it right now that now I can go. It's like the whole process of it, the writing it, all those like the tears and the struggle. And they're like, what am I going to write? How am I going to rewrite this? What am I going to do? Does this even make sense? Are they going to like it? That's all done, but now it's in the, the next process starts, which is I get to do interviews with great people like you and Mike, and I get to talk to some Hallmarkies later on, and, and I get to you know tweet and text and Instagram and story stuff and all about the movie and talk about when it's airing, and I get to meet not new people and then talk about new movies. Like, mm. 
that's all the process. It's not the outcome. That outcome is fleeting, right? That's and it's super interesting. Because you know, when you talk about what it takes to spend nine years in a town and spend 30 years on a career, if yeah. you are focused on outcomes, that can be a disappointing reality. After, it's always going to be a disappointment. The outcome is never going to be, you always are going to want more. As human beings, which we all are, um, most of us anyway, there are some you know, people that are dressed as Satan that live in other parts <laughs> of our country, but that's a whole other story. But um, you know, we're all human beings, so we all, we're always going to want more. We're always going to want the next best thing. Somebody else's lawn is going to be greener. It's never going to, it's always the way we're, we're conditioned to be. We can get something literally on our phones in one second. I could have dinner delivered in 20 minutes and I don't have to do a damn thing. And I can keep on my fat pants, which is great. That's an awesome, let's not down that. That's a good thing. That's a great thing. But like that outcome, that changes, right? If, if everyone hated the movie for some reason and it came out crappy, then that, account, that outcome would have been bad. So if you, I would have wasted two and a half years on that outcome. If you are the kind of person that's searching for like how you're going to model your career, I watch people and I'm like, yeah. okay, what is it about that person? I'll take away things like, oh, I want to, I really admire that. I want to be more of that. I want to see what that is, my version of that, yeah. right? And I've stolen over the years from so many people about the person that I wanted to become in what motivated me and what my purpose and my why was. And if you can focus it, not on outcome, but just for the attrition of it, the love of the process, that's a pretty powerful thing. It will change the way you spend the next 20 years of your life. It will, it will change the way, not just your professional life, but your personal life. That's right? super like, valuable. It's got to be the journey. As right? kids, as kids, all we do is say, hey, what's my big break? When do I need to get to score the winning goal in hockey? Hey, what's my right. big break when I get to slam dunk or score a touchdown right. or be at number one or get a Grammy? But right. if you can find the love of the process, the mundane, the years in and out in between the arbitrary awards, whether you should get them or yeah. not, then it's like, whoa, right. that person that person has the tenacity to say, hey, I just want to be happy. Yeah. And when I ask you, do you want a publishing deal? You're like, I don't know. Hey, do you want to have a number one song? What would that be like? You're like, that'd be great. I think it's more about the process of, that is a person that can spend the next nine years that you need to have that kind of, be able to hold your breath in this business. Yeah. That's yeah. a really, po if people only understood, they're so blinded by the not knowing not having right. perspective. And the best thing about a podcast like this is that we get to talk to people that have rung the bell and you get yeah. to say like, oh, wait a minute. They did everything I'm hoping to do and now they're saying this is what they value, this is what they focus on. I think that's super, that super powerful. We're always gonna have the carrot. It's always gonna be dangling. That's, yeah. that's, that's a given. But if you're not having fun while you're chasing the damn carrot, you are going to be so unhappy. And I'm saying this yeah. from personal experience. I spent every day like that in LA, chasing the carrot and not being happy. And man, I love what I do. And the unknown that you just talked about, it's like, I live for that shit. That's the stuff I'm like, give me the unknown. And it's that, but, but yes, if you're going to say, give me the unknown, I'm into, I'm ready to go. You got to be able to that, actually take that first step into it too. Cause it's not just saying like, I love it. I'm ready for it. you got to take action behind it. Like, then you got to go be in that unknown. And that is not comfortable by any means. There's a no one probably would tell you that it is. And if they did, I'd say you're a flipping liar because it's not comfortable to be in the unknown, but that's the fun of it. Like yeah. you don't know, you know? Yeah. I uh, mean, if everything was mapped out and you saw exactly what was going to happen and what song you're going to get your Grammy on, you know, after that, you'd be like, well, now what? Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I have uh, grown. I used to hate the unknown. I used to get into a songwriting room and I'd be like, we got to get the course. We got to get the course. Yes. We got to figure this out. What's we don't have a course yet. Oh, it's, we've been here for two hours. Yeah. We don't have a course. And now I have grown to love that part of the song. Yeah. And sometimes I'm disappointed because the course we got didn't live up to my imagination of what yeah. it was. Cause anything's possible when you don't know. Exactly. You know, well, you, know so. what? You, you, me and Scott Reeves, we wrote, we've written a couple songs, right? And there was one day, if you remember, we wrote in the barn, which I love. Um, and I think I said I wanted to live in the barn and I still hold you to that. I really want to live in the barn. Um, but we, we wrote like for four or five hours, we worked on something. And it was you that said, guys, I'm not feeling it. 
And Scott and I were like, oh, what? We like that. And you're like, no, it doesn't, it's not right. And all of a sudden, we went off on a whole nother song, created something, wrote something that was absolutely not country. Remember that was like this funky, funk pop, like. Freak flag? Yes, freak flag. Like, yeah, and let I your freak it, flag fly. Right? We are yeah. freak flag flyers. But we were like, it was so random and so different. Yeah. But it was the unknown. Like, it was, it was exactly what you just described. And we were like, okay, let's run with this. And yep. it was so different than any of us ever. Like, if we, we all had it mapped out what we were going to do. We all had our ideas. We liked this idea. We ran with that one. And it was very good. And it was a lot like a lot of other songs. But it was still a good song. And then you're like, nope. And it was... Man, we we created something totally. Well, different you know, out of the you know, Marty Dotson and um, Jason Matthews were writing all day, and they went to lunch, and they said they got back, and Marty said, "I don't really like this song," and Jason <laughs> said, "Oh, I thought you liked it," and they both didn't like it. Oh and my they, god! And in the afternoon, they wrote, "Just got no, not just got to love you." Uh, you must be doing something right. They started oh, from scratch and they wrote uh -uh. Must Be Doing Something Right, which was a massive hit for Billy Carrington. And Mike has this great story about Five Feet From Gold. Remember that story, Mike? Uh, three Feet From Gold? Yeah. yeah. From, uh, it's from like How to Win Friends and Influence People or, or Think and Grow Rich. I think it's actually from the book. The old, I know exactly what it is. Yeah, so it's just a, uh, a paraphrasing. But it's uh, a guy borrowed all of the money he could from friends and family went to, you know, the story, but it, it was a gold miner, you know, and, uh, uh, didn't work out. He sold everything for pennies on the dollar sold to some other dude who hired a geologist. <laughs> they dug three more feet and he hit one of the largest gold veins in yeah. history. Yeah. That's but what we are awesome. every day. We are three feet from gold. I love not knowing what direction it is. I love, it's like, you have to be wired for that. But if you can yeah. love the process and not just focus on having the number one song and the, like that little fleeting moment you're talking about, yeah. you, can, you can actually be a part of some uh, years of speculation that sometimes pans out, pun intended. It, you know I mean? But it doesn't, you're not also like cutting yourself with a butter knife at home either. Like, you know, if it doesn't work out, then you're like, okay, well, that wasn't, that didn't work out like I thought it would, but guess what? It opened up these five doors. Yeah. Like, it's just, you know. This is, this is priceless information that the younger me, I don't yeah. know that I was even capable of hearing it. I could hear this exact conversation. No. But I would still be so preoccupied with the shiny object, right? Yes. I don't know that yes. the words would, would hit me, but it truly is. Every person you see go through success and go through a life that you've admired their creative work, you yeah. notice that they're in it for a different why, not the... Yeah. It's why, why it's why Rick Rubin shows up to the Grammys in the, I was looking, when we went to the Grammys, I was looking for outfits to go to the Grammys. So I searched, yeah. there's a picture of Rick Rubin in, I don't even know how a t-shirt gets that wrinkly. Like, it's like it was professionally wrinkled. No. And shorts, like odd, like bicycle shorts and flip flops on the red carpet. And I was like, that dude has got it all figured out. Yeah. Because you know what? He was having fun and he was being himself. Yeah. It was like the most baller move. It was like the neg. I don't know. You know, it was just like this total that's power play. It's like he showed up and he's like standing there posing for pictures in this outfit. That's like in shorts and flip flops. Freaking genius. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming and hanging out with us. Oh for, man. For today. Anytime. I'm kidding. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. You're you're obviously an extraordinary person. Thank or, you, Jojo. Or what I like to say, extraordinary. A little bit more than ordinary. It's all we really... Extraordinary seems so unattainable, but if somebody says extraordinary, because that's what it is, right? Then you could say, okay, I'm ordinary. I just need a little extra. How do I do that? A little extra. That's what so, we all should aspire to be, a little extra. Well, thank you for that. Hopefully, we'll thank be playing together so soon much. once this calamity's over. This, Yeah, that would be great if I could see your face again in real life. Congratulations. Amazing. You canceled Thanksgiving thank on us two years ago. You were supposed to come. And so she canceled sorry. because she needed to finish a script that was the script that went on to be this movie that was just was aired. So congratulations. It was well worth it. And it shows you how long it takes. Like, and yet when it was time to go, it was like, it, it was when I tell you, I mean, it was not happening. I had rewritten it again in June and then they're like, not until January we're done. And I'm like, ah, okay, fine. We'll have real snow. It's gonna be awesome. And then three weeks later, it was like, we're going and we're going right now. How fast can you rewrite it again? I mean, this is that business where if you're ready for it, I mean, you always have to be ready. Hey, Period. where can people find you on the interwebs? 
So on the interwebs, you can find me at RileyWeston.com, just my name uh, on, my in, on my website. You could send me, if anybody wants to find me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook um, or even on my website, I will send them a Christmas song um, that I have, which might or might not be based on that movie I just talked to you about. <laughs> and um, and then, uh, yeah, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. And um, send us those links. We'll put them down in our description. Remember to I like and subscribe it. to our podcast and share with friends. We are both a video and audio podcast. So you can find us anywhere audio podcasts are on all your devices, as well as on YouTube. If you want to see Riley's beautiful face in her set that she made a beautiful little <laughs> lifetime set behind her. Look, this is my this is my like little music room where I used to write music before COVID. But this is like I didn't have to do anything. Like I just put a tray table up to but put on the But you keep the Santas up year round? Um so um this is going to be remotely embarrassing but I don't care. I stopped I stopped caring a long time ago. So no, not in the music room. However, if you walk down like my hallway to my bedroom and my office which kind of split, um you will always see a Merry Christmas sign and stockings and like a cool Jack Frost picture and my office is full on Christmas pictures, Ooh. Santas, snowmen. It's full. It's well, amazing. this is this has got to be a beautiful day for you. Look, right now, as we tape this, there is like snow oh. blowing around as if it's like in a snow globe outside the window, which is rare here yes. in Nashville. So, so it's a perfect great. day. Riley's in front of a, a crackling fireplace, at least what I looks am. like a crackling fireplace. It is. Yeah, the real okay. fire. Look at you. Yeah. Well, Thank enjoy you. the rest yeah. of your day. Thank you so much for hanging out with you. We love you. Thanks, guys, so much. Thank you. That's it. This time from the West Barn, we're signing off. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time from the West Barn.